All right, hey, seven tips for selling insurance over the phone. It You asked a million times, we're answering. Here's a video on how to sell insurance from home. Before I give you these seven tips for getting great at this, right here, I wanna tell you about a webinar that's going on tomorrow with Ramiz Hakeem and North Star Insurance Advisors. Go to apersonation.com slash webinar. It's four and a half hours of telesales content. It's gonna be an unbelievable webinar. You definitely need to be there. Starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. on Saturday. If you're watching this later, you can still get the recording of that, okay? So before I go into the specific tips for selling insurance over the phone, one of the first things that you need is you need good equipment when you're selling insurance over the phone, right? If you've got a slow computer, if you've got a crappy headset, you know, whatever, right? You need good equipment. So I always like, you know, a nice com good computer, a couple monitors, two monitors, a nice headset. We use different ones, all right? You used to sell, see me wear the big Logitech, uh, white and black, uh, big Logitech. I think it was like G, I don't know, whatever, 935 or something. And now we're using like a nice couple hundred dollar Alienware, all of our sales team. But you need a good headset, all right? Preferably noise canceling. After good equipment, you also need to think about before I give you these tips, all right? And stay with me till the very end. And I'll tell you it's some, at the very something at the very end that you probably didn't know. Okay, is you need to also eliminate distractions around you. It's going to be real easy when you're selling from home, when you're working from home, to get distracted. Kids running around, wife, etc. You need to be lock yourself in a room for a few hours. Get focused on getting great at this. Some people are already good at it. But a lot of people are asking me and they're not good at it. And they're like, dude, I want to know about it. So I'm going to talk about it. Okay. I feel like I'm as equipped to talk about it as anybody. All right. So here's the, here's the first tip of seven. The first one is you need good lead flow. Okay. You need either, you need either digital leads, which we can help you with at either secure agent leads or secure agent marketing, or you need live transfers, which now we also have partnered with North Star Insurance Advisors to provide live transfers for final expense, the same ones they use through Secure Agent Marketing. Okay? Why is lead flow so important? Because it's very, very difficult to sell insurance now by cold calling. Now, could you do it? Yeah, but I'd rather bang my head against the wall. You know, I used to do it, but there's better ways now. That's why we are able to get you digital leads for that are for telesales for six to twelve bucks, you know? So, and you need lead flow because you may have a good week one week, but if you don't have consistent leads coming in every week, you're going to be inconsistent. You're going to fail the next week. You're not going to have consistent results, right? You want to do a couple grand a week, you need consistent leads every single week. So lead flow, that's really important. The second thing is activity. Most individuals will not put forth the dials and the effort that it takes to be successful at telesales and selling insurance for phone. Now, could I send myself some leads and make 10 sales this weekend and put up probably seven grand over the phone in like 48 hours? Yes, because I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. I've done it for years. I, I, I used to be able to literally do 69 grand in a month because of high activity. When you have high activity, good things happen. You may not be really good on the phone yet, but if you have high activity, you can eliminate the lack of skill with effort, all right? And activity, activity, activity is key, it's big. Third thing is follow-up. When you're working with digital leads especially, you need follow-up. I always talk about 12 touches in the first 72 hours, okay? That's the one thing. And I talk about six calls, six of those being phone calls in the first 72 hours, the first three days because most people don't follow up enough. 80% of sales are made between the fifth to 12th contact, but most insurance agents go one to two touches max. That's what most insurance agents do. And a lot of insurance agents don't call a lead at all. They pay for it, they get it, but they're so lazy that they never actually pick up the phone and call it. Like, why would you invest money in something why would, you even, why would you even want to sell insurance if you're going to be so lazy and so consumed with lack of confidence and lack of effort that you don't go any touches? But again, the average insurance agent goes one or two touches when they're calling leads. You need to increase this drastically. You need to go more touches, right? The fourth thing is script. You need a system, right? Which is why 
You could say, well, dude, 900 bucks for, for a webinar tomorrow is too much. Dude, I think it's too much not to do it. They're going to do 34 million this year in final expense telesales and they're giving it all away to you for a measly $900. Like if I would rob a bank to pay for that, it's going to be that good and that much gold. That's all I got to say. It's ridiculous. Okay. A good script and a good system can take a lot of the guesswork out. Most people don't know what to do because there's guesswork and they don't know what to say and, and, and they end up saying stupid stuff or they treat it the exact same way as they would treat an in-home in appointment. When an in-home appointment you would warm up, but on the phone you don't warm up as much because you need to get control immediately early in the call. A script and a system is vital to you having success. Okay. The fifth thing, fifth thing is control. You have to get control immediately at the beginning of the call. Ramiz is going to talk about this tomorrow in the webinar of why, again, apresentation.com forward slash webinar on why getting control early in the call. He's going to actually give you the first few pages of his script. When you purchase, you, you already get that in the previous recording. And then parts two and three, he's going to go over the rest of the cell tomorrow. Gaining control, being in control, not answering their questions until you're ready is important. And he's going to touch on that tomorrow. I've heard, I've heard him do it a million times and it's absolute pure gold. You must be in control. And I don't mean get control by just vomiting and talking a lot. That's not what he would say. And that's not what I would say. The great salespeople, the prospect talks more than you do. Great salespeople ask questions. They listen, they steer the path and they are in control of what happens next. Okay. The sixth thing is you need to be relational. This is a relationship business. You need people buy from people they know, like, and trust. Well, you need them to like you and trust you. And it takes time. It takes patience. It takes a relationship and you're not going to make a telesale in three minutes or seven minutes. It takes a little bit of time. Stories, right? Facts tell stories sell. I just shot a video earlier on that today that will come out later. It's important because relationship is important. People buy when they feel comfortable with you and you want them feeling comfortable with you because that's when they're going to choose to do business with you. And the last tip, are you ready? Is you have to assume every step of the way. From the beginning, I'm assuming they're going to answer the phone. I assume they're going to talk to me. I assume they're going to talk to me for 45 minutes. I assume they're going to love the benefits. I assume they're going to love the features. I assume they're going to love the options. I assume they're going to pick the middle one because 80% of the time they pick the one in the middle out of the three options, right? You need to assume that they're going to love you. You're going to have a great relationship with them. They're going to talk to you for an hour. They're going to buy. They're going to keep you forever and they're not going to change their mind. Assuming is the way to continue to not only keep control, but to be relational and to follow a script and a system. So that the whole time you are following something that works. That's why you could just bang your head against the wall and just keep doing the wrong thing over and over and over and over and over again. Or you can get on tomorrow's webinar, you can pay a little bit of money and you can end up seeing better results with this because you decided, you know what? I'm going to go for it. You know what? I'm going to take this seriously. You know what? I believe anyone in, in our industry can be successful at selling over the phone. Most of the people that watch this won't commit. Most people that watch this won't go all in on it. Most people that watch this won't have a lead flow. Most people that watch this won't have enough activity. Most people that watch this won't, have, won't follow up enough. Most people that watch this won't have the right script and system and they'll never pay for the right script and system because I don't pay for stuff. I figured it out on my own. I, I fell for three years and then I, and then I, you know, maybe, maybe I'm part of the 92% or maybe I fell for three years and I finally figure it out. Well, who wants to fail for three years when you can just freaking buy it? Okay. Control. Great sales people are in control. Most people watching this struggle to get control. He, we're going to tell you on tomorrow's webinar exactly how to get control. Great sales people are great at building relationships, right? Most of you reach out to me daily, constantly on Instagram and everywhere else because I care about you. You can tell, you know, you can trust me and you feel like, and I feel like we have a great relationship because you've watched 2000 of our videos. Okay. Same thing for being assumptive. Great salespeople are assumptive. Most people that are watching this will not be assumptive enough and you need to be assumptive. You need to be great at this. It's the secret to selling interest from these are seven tips. Okay. You need good equipment. You need to stick with these seven tips. You need to eliminate distractions. You need to get serious, set a goal, and then go freaking achieve it. Just commit. Go all in. JB the Wolf is in the house. Dude, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it, buddy. My pleasure. 8% Nation, we have the Wolf of Wall Street, Mr. Jordan Belfort. In, we're doubling down, right? Because he's going to be in Vegas with us, but we're doubling down and we got him on virtual as well. 
huge thanks to you, buddy, for spending some time with us and doing this with us. Uh, I, I don't think anyone needs, you know, like an introduction per se. You know, if they do, I would say just go watch the movie, right? I mean, would you agree with that? Well, I mean, you know, the movies, you know, is mostly true. I mean, some of the things that, that are in the movie are not true, but the, the things that you think would not be true are true, and the things that aren't true, it's like the opposite, you know? But I think it's a good feeling. Listen, the bottom line is that, um, you know, in the context of what we're talking about today, you know, the secret to my success, you know, on Wall Street and throughout my life has been my ability to take people who maybe are not natural born closers and very quickly turn them into superstar salespeople. And frankly, on Wall Street, stockbrokers are glorified salespeople. That's what you're doing. So Wall Street is, you know, people think of Wall Street, you think of analysts or investment bankers or Gordon Gecko. In reality, yeah, there are those types of people out there. But most of all, you have people on the phone, calling away, closing deals. So there you go. Let, 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 let's jump into that. I, I, I love that. Uh, so do you believe that there are natural born closers? Yeah, of course there are natural born closers. I mean, I am one. And I've seen many. Obviously, there are different degrees of it. So, you know, imagine like anything else. There's a continuum. So, yeah, there's natural born closers and there's like natural born closers at the highest level. So I was that guy that was the uber natural born closer. And what that means to me is that, you know, in some way, uh, my brain, the way it's wired, the experiences that I've had, intuitively, I know exactly what someone needs to hear, what I need to look like, how I need to say things to essentially get someone to agree with my point of view, which is buy from me, that what I have is value, it makes sense for you to part with your hard-earned money. So natural born clothes, without really even thinking about it, just intuitively knows what the other person needs to hear to get them to say yes. Now, obviously, you can unpack that a lot more. What does that mean then? We can really break it down to you know, as minuscule little chunks as you want here, and that's actually what I did. Because what happens is, if you ask most natural born clothes, hey, you know, what do you do? How do you close at such a high level? They'll be like, oh, well, I just, you know, I, I'm a good people person, or oh, I'm an, I overcome every objection, or you know, I, I work hard, knock on lots of doors. They really can't verbalize it. And if you can't verbalize it, you can't chunk it down, then you can't teach other people. So while, yeah, I was an amazing salesperson myself, and I always looked at that as my superpower, my real superpower, was that I had the ability to transfer that skill to other people. And that was really how I made all the money. It was by taking people who were not natural born closers. In fact, some were just terrible closers. And I made them great. And I took people who were great and made them into the top 1% in the world. So wherever they were, you can rash yourself up. Yeah, and, and is, is that what you're doing now, right? Mostly, mostly training those that aren't natural born closers or that are to be simply better at their craft. Yeah, I mean, I, I go around the world and I do, you know, for the most part, my business really consists of a couple of things. Number one is actually recruiting. Companies hire my company to go out there and find the top producers of tomorrow. It's a fiercely competitive landscape in the past, right? So watch this. In the past, you know, it was full employment. You know, you had to find great closers, right? So it was very easy for me with my brand to go out there and find the kids coming out of college or those that are just out there floundering in the workplace, haven't found the right place to work yet. And because my brand, I can attract them, then train them, and then deliver them to a company. That's one aspect of it, right? In a post-COVID world, now what you have is a real problem for employers, is that, think about this, this is a really interesting thing. You think, wow, now the employers have the pick of the litter. Everyone's out of work, there's so many people looking for jobs. Okay, great, but what happened? Let's slow that down for a second. When companies laid off the bulk of their workforce, if we focus on the sales aspect, who did they lay off? The bottom 80%, the top 20%, the top producers get their job. So what you have now is a huge pool of people who are not at the top of the heap. So you need to be really, really careful as an employer right now who you hire because you might end up with a bunch of mid-level and low-level producers that you really can't build a world-class sales organization around. So I have systems and psychometric tests that are proprietary that sift through people 
And I also have this intuitively, my team, you know, after so many years, they're just spotting out the people that really have what it takes and that are dedicated. And then we actually train those people using a system called the straight line, which many people know about, which is the system I've been teaching for many years of how you step-by-step step become a world-class closer and deliver those and onboard those to companies. That's my system. That's awesome. So, so when, when, I mean, and there's a lot of in individuals and companies that are going to be watching this that what should they look for when they're hiring people? Well, number one, you got to realize that the typical interview questions out there are like, they're all well-known and most people, just to put it bluntly, are, you know, what, what do you do when you're going through an interview? You're, you're full of shit, basically. You send your representative. It's like, you know, you always say when you're on a date with someone, you don't really know the person you're dating until three months because for the first three months, they send their representative. It's like their best self. And then only, you know, wait, what are you, I can't believe, like, well, oh, I was lying at first, you know what I mean? So, so, you, so there are questions, and what we do, especially, so there's, there's two sides. Number one, there's psychometric testing. That's actually my own proprietary test based on what I've seen over the years. This was I have something I, I created in conjunction with psychologists, um, and it's really intense. So it's 30 ways to ask the same questions to get to the truth of it. And then based on that, you see what certain competencies are, their predispositions, predispositions, for example. Someone might not be great for cold calling, but they'll be a world-class closer. They'll be the guy that you want to close. Other people not, might not be great at closing, but they're amazing at managing the long-term relationship, which is equally important for life of, that lifetime value of a customer. Some people are meant to just be more in face-to-face -face sales, others out there in the so you gotta know, so all salesmen aren't built alike. So this really sifts through all those people. Then through behavioral interviewing, you can really narrow that down even further. And then once you have those people, and here's this two other parts. The number one is onboarding. So when, you know, the, the biggest danger point for any salesperson is the first 30 days. They have to show up already trained. So I'm a big believer. Like I look at every company, say, what's your biggest pain point in sales? Attrition. First year attrition of a salesperson is the death knell of every sales force. If you can get a salesperson trained, onboarded correctly, and they don't leave that first year, you are literally at the top of the heap when it comes to sales, bottom line. The issue that I see, even with really successful companies, for example, I do a lot of work in logistics and pharmaceuticals and auto, they will have 60 plus percent attrition rates and they're still making a fortune. That's how insane it is. Sometimes I had a company that had an 85% attrition rate. They were hiring 300 salesmen a year and blowing through 85% of them before I got involved. All right. And they were, and they were a billion dollar company. Yeah. So just imagine the impact it has on a company's bottom line where you can choose who are the right people to actually hire. B, make sure they're trained to a razor's edge on your industry specific items before they show up, onboard them correctly and then also coach them. We also coach them afterwards free of charge for a period of two years to make sure they perform. So to me, that's a formula for success. Of course, skill set, that's part of the training, but you gotta get the right person as well. Yeah, well, I mean, when, when, when you talk through like finding the right people, sifting through and you and your team, when you do, how, how do you end up identifying the right person. Do you, do you use a, do you use a, like a disc assessment, assessments? Is there a certain- No, I use my own. No, I, it just doesn't work. I found that it doesn't work at disc. I think it's, I think it's mostly, I, no offense. I just think that, you know, a, a non, my, my system, my test is proprietary just for sales. So if you're looking to hire psychologists or, or, or office workers, don't use my, what I do. I specialize in one thing to do better than anyone in the world. That is, I know salespeople. I know what, how they tick. And, and I spent years unpacking that into a scientifically proven formula of how you spot out them with the, this is just a predisposition to succeed. It does not mean they're going to succeed. They need to be trained, they need to be onboarded correctly. And it's that at first year in, in the life of a salesperson, the reason that's so important is because of the way the belief systems work. Success begets success. When someone goes into sales and they fail in the beginning, they start to develop limiting beliefs about themselves, their capabilities, and it becomes this almost self-defeating cycle here. So it's critical that the first experience that someone has in sales is a good one. Now, granted, there's many people, and I've made my, my living taking people who were failing and making them succeed. But if, it, if I'm talking just from the company perspective and an experience at a company, the key is, is you want them starting off 
on the right foot. So to me, the worst thing a company could do is to put people out there in the field or on the phone who are not ready, who don't know what they're doing. A, it's destructive to your brand because they say stupid shit. They say, you know, they do stupid things, right? And, and, and two, you find people who could have succeeded with the right training and the right, if they had the skill sets to close and knew the product well enough, yet you self-sabotage because they start off on the wrong foot, they never get going, and that spreads throughout the sales force. And that's why you have so many subpar sales forces out there. So it's, you know, it's not like it's just finding the right person. It's finding the right person, making sure they're trained correctly, onboarded correctly, and it's especially that year one attrition is, is the crucial part for anyone who owns a company and also for, this, for you, the salesperson yourself, because the bottom line is, is how you perform in the beginning is gonna set the stage for a cycle of belief building that propels you to being a top producer. Absolutely, I totally agree with everything you're saying. From a confidence standpoint, you can just totally crush it. You know, uh, yeah. I love that. I love that. That's really good. Uh, well, when 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 you look when 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 we, I want to jump to the straight line for a second. For those that don't know, maybe what that is or what that means, can, can you break that down and explain that for a quick second? Sure. So the straight line, that's the actual sales training aspect to what I do. And I think it's probably the most well-known system in the world. It's been, you know, obviously I'm gonna have the benefit of a movie where Leo DiCaprio is with my logo straight line in the background, sell me this pen, right? But what the straight line really is, it's a backwards way of looking at selling. Meaning rather than saying, you know, you know it's like, okay, I'm standing at the front. What do I do here? I gotta close this person. It's, Imagine a person that bought, what would they have to hear? What things would they need to know? What would they want to see before they said yes? So you say, what elements have to line up in another person's mind to get them to say yes? And when you have experience this, you'll quickly find out there are just a few things, it's not a million things. There are three things, core elements that must line up in every person's mind before they buy a product. And then there are a couple of ancillary things as well for the tougher closes. So that's one part of it is what are these five core elements that must line up? What are the things you have to say to essentially get them to line up? So the straight line essentially, imagine it's the shortest distance to two points is a straight line, right? So the philosophy is that at the beginning you have the open, at the end you have the close, and the straight line represents the perfect conversation. Imagine like an objectionless close where the person was a lay down. They were almost pre-sold before you ever opened up your mouth to speak. And as a salesperson, if you knock on enough doors or make enough calls, eventually you're gonna find people who just, oh yeah, great, oh my God, they're almost pre-sold to the easiest closes of all. So that represents that perfect straight line sale, an objectionless close where the prospect agreed with everything you said. And the only problem is that those are few and far between. In the real world of sales, people have objections, they have questions, they interrupt you, they cut you off, they have concerns. So you as the salesman wanna keep them on the straight line, they want to go off the straight line. So what we have, is this methodology that gives you boundaries above and below the line. How far the conversation can stray off of perfection before you lose control of the sale and start spiraling off to what I call to Pluto, where you're talking about the price of tea in China or things that have no relation to the sale or down here to your anus, not a good place for salespeople to be. The point is, is that what I realized, there was this magic moment I had when I, I couldn't get my guys, to, this is 30 years ago, right? When I was trying to train my first 12 salespeople and I was already teaching an amazing system. It didn't have a name, but I was a great sales trainer even then. But I had switched from selling average moms and pops to the richest 1% of Americans. And the sale was infinitely harder. So it was a really tough sale. So the system I was teaching, the old one, yeah, it was good enough to close average moms and pops. But take the same type of sale to super rich, uh-uh, the system broke down, it collapsed. So I had to invent a new way of training sales because here's what was happening. I was calling the same and I was closing 50% of the people I spoke to. My junior partner, Danny, was calling these people. He was closing 30%. Yet my 12 average kids who had barely clawed their way out of high school, they were closing zero. 
same leads, same script, same phone calls, selling the same product. I'm closing half, they're closing zero. I, I couldn't understand it. And that went on for a month. And I finally cracked the code in this one evening and I realized what it was was something very elemental. It was really simple, actually. What it was, and it's easy to learn, is that I had a certain way of talking, a certain way of looking, a certain way of, of, of the energy I exuded that literally from the first few seconds of the conversation, when I get on the phone with a prospect or face to face, they would perceive me in a certain way. And based on that perception, which was that I was sharp as a tack, enthusiastic as hell and an expert, most importantly, an expert in my field. They'd say, wow, this is not the average bear, not the average guy. And they'd say, this is an expert. And they would defer to me. They would let me control the flow of the encounter. Because what we do, we've been conditioned since we're yay big to defer to experts. We let experts guide us. We seek out experts to solve our problems. So by getting yourself into that, that position where you're perceived sharp, enthusiastic, an expert in your field, people defer to you. And once they do, they essentially hand you control of the sale. Well, guess what? Now you can start lining up the elements in the same way every time. So I had this philosophy. I said to my guys, guys, don't you get it? Like every sale is the same. And they were like, what? Like, how could every sale be the same? I'm like, guys, every sale is the same. See, to me, because I was taking control, every, I could move it down the same path every time. Yes, people have different needs, different values, different pain points. They say different things, but the same core elements must line up in a prospect's mind before they say yes. And with the straight line system, once you're in control, you can then line those elements up in the same order every time. It's almost like picking the lock of a safe. The way you crack a safe cracker, cracks a safe. He puts his ear, spins it one way, click, he hears a number. Does he try to open the safe? No, he knows there's more numbers. He spins it the other way, he hears the second click. Spins it the third way, he hears the third click, and then he tests it. That's when you ask for the order. If he got all three numbers right, the safe opens. If it does, it wants to do, oh, damn, it's uncrackable. No, he goes back to the beginning and he tries the three numbers again. So with the straight line, we have a very similar tactic. We call looping, we loop back and try again. And every time you essentially run these patterns, you're cracking these numbers of his buying combination. You ask for the order is essentially seeing if the safe will open. And when it opens, victory. That's the shortest way to explain it. And it's so simple to learn that when I teach it to companies at the people, like they have these about 30 or 40% uptick in close rate in a matter of days. That's just in days and much more after. It's a very simple system. And the reason it's simple is because it had to be, because my guys were basically morons. They were not NASA scientists. They were kids that barely graduated high school. They came from poor families. They could barely walk and shoot gum at the same time. The, in the movie, it was very accurate. They were, that, they were that fucking dumb, all right? So because of that, I had to invent a, a system that was so simple and so intuitive, so easy to learn, that even a moron could learn it because they were morons, bottom line. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and I love how simple you make it, right? G getting in control earlier, uh, you know, following the straight line to, if they if they, if they give you an objection obviously you're pivoting back i mean it's it makes a ton of sense that's one of the things that i'm glad we're covering because the theme of 8% nation is that 92% of insurance agents fail well the 92% that fail the most common thing that we hear from them that they have questions on is objections and and being able to overcome objections and objections just startling them and scaring them you know and so i love that you're addressing that remember, yeah remember this so, so that one little point here is that objections are smoke screens for uncertainty. Mm -hmm. If someone says to you, let me think about it, or let me call you back, that's very different than saying, no, I'm not interested. See, no means no. In my mind, so the, no, I don't want it. They're not having, I don't, see, as a salesperson, there's one thing everyone here takes away from this outside the critical importance of being in control of the conversation 
is that as a salesperson, as a top producer, your job is not to take the word no and turn it into yes. That's not how sales will make their money. I don't turn no's into buyers. I turn, let me think about it, into buyers. I turn bad time of year into buyers. I turn, let me speak to my wife, into buyers. I take objections. It's very different than, no, I don't want it. I'd rather knock on the next door, make the next call. I'm not in trying to convince someone to buy something they don't want or need. I want people who need my product, want my product, can benefit from my product, right? But they are skeptical, not, and as they should be. So when someone hits me with an objection, what I'm saying to myself is, ah, perfect. They're interested, it's a smoke screen. They're not certain yet. So I will answer the objection, whatever that objection might be, but by answering the objection, all I've done is given myself the right to speak more. So, you know, if someone says, I want to speak to my wife, and I have an answer why, well, you really don't need to speak to your wife, blah, 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 reason why. If I then try to close the sale, I have no shot. But because the wife was just a knee-jerk reaction. Okay. Now in some industries, maybe they actually do. So like, you know, you can, so in some cases, probably not the best one to use. Better is let me think about it. All right. Let me think about it means I need to think about it to become more certain. So so let me think about it. I will answer the objection, but I'll never ask for the order afterwards. I answer the objection and then loop back and create more certainty about the product, about myself, the salesperson, meaning that I'm trustworthy, dependable, you want me in your life for the long term, the company that stands behind, in this case, the insurance product, and then I will ask for the order. So an objection only gives me the right to speak more. When I ask, it's the answer to the objection, the rebuttal, gives me the right to speak more. It's when I say after that, that's gonna get the job done. That's good, that's really good. I wanna transition now to, uh... One of the things that I'm always studying and wanting to learn from successful people, and, and I know agents that are part of our conference are the exact same way, is the daily habits, the routine of those successful people. Uh, what, what are some of your daily habits or, or routine or that you recommend for others? When it comes to selling, you know, to me, I, I never would sell, oh, I'm going to go out and sell for an hour. I'm going to dial up for 30 minutes. It, it doesn't work. You need to have blocks of time dedicated to do this. this is the biggest thing number one is that if i'm gonna go out there and i'm gonna cold call i'm doing it for two or three hours block of time i'm not gonna do it for 20 minutes you know i got free 20 minutes to make a few cold calls if i'm gonna go out to knock on doors i'm going out for six hours I'll, whatever that amount of time is i set a time number two i don't ever here's a big one i don't ever take good days and use that as an opportunity to stop early. Wow, I made two sales today. Done. No. If I made two sales and I'm hot, I'm going for six sales. Yeah. In other words, I set time frames. I'm going to knock on doors till X time, or I'm going to make calls until X time, and I am literally going to make every single call till that clock hits. I don't care how bad I'm doing, how, how negative people are towards me, or how awesome I'm doing. I am unabated going through that time period. And third, with every single call, every single pitch, every single knock or go, whichever way you're doing it, right? So every call, I'm as excited as my first call. See, this is the problem a lot of salespeople have in terms of that inner game, is what happens is, is throughout the day, you're saying the same thing over and over and over again, so you almost start feeling silly about that level of enthusiasm, of excitement. And so when you go into a typical sales room, it's like, gonna dull there, how you doing, Mr. Jones? And yet in the morning, in those first, the first picture day, they're like, hey, how you doing? And they're really upbeat. What you don't realize is that this person, whether you're calling at that moment, they're hearing it for the first time. Every pitch has gotta be like your first pitch. So I've learned, is I've gotten to this habit over the years of triggering this positive, empowered state in the beginning of every sales call. So I treat every sales call like it's my first sales call. Those are three examples of habits I have when I'm selling. And also, I do massive preparation. I would never sell something without knowing what I have to say before I'm going to say it. 
I script out everything before it. I know my language patterns, the logical cases I'm making, how I'm gonna make the emotional case. I want to know all about my product, the product knowledge is that necessary, all the benefits, the features that are associated with those benefits. I'm gonna have comparisons and metaphors and examples to use. I'm gonna have all of that stuff memorized up here and in front of me if I'm on the phone. Obviously, when I'm in person, I'm not like looking at him, so I'm not doing it in person, but the point is, is I prepare myself. I don't wing it. That's crucial. That's really good, yeah. And, and, and you embodied that, you know, whether you're sell, selling coolers on the beach or meat out of a freezer or stocks, you know, I mean, all those things you said, you, you, you embodied, you know, I mean, you, 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 you just mentioned perfectly in line with the theme for this, of this virtual conference, which is if you don't quit, you can't fail. And a lot of agents out there. I, I think that a lot of people really don't understand, like, you know, what rejection really means in terms of, um, not, not, so, so, so the very, like, sort of the, the simple way of looking at it is like, oh, they're not rejecting me personally. They're rejecting blah, blah. And we've all read that in books. That doesn't really go very far with most people. They still feel terrible about it. They still feel like they're, it's, they still feel futile. It's an exercise of futility. Let me give you a better way of looking at this, okay? And that is keeping track of exactly how many cold calls you make in a day, how many presentations you make in a day, and how many of those ultimately lead to closes. Once you know those numbers, let's say you know you gotta make 100 dials or knock on 100 doors to get one sale, and that sale's gonna make you $5,000. I'm just, I'm just completely making up numbers here, right? Those numbers could be anything, right? So that means that I make $5,000, right? over a hundred door knocks. That means I'm making $20 for every time I knock on a door, not $5,000 for one close. So I don't look at it like I make $5,000 every time I close a sale. I make 20 bucks every time I knock on the door. That means the no's are as good as the yeses. Someone says, have a nice day. I'm like, that's 20 hours. So when, they, when I don't close the sale, I make 20 bucks. Every call is 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks. Rather than saying I'm making nothing and I only make money when I close, it's not true. Because it's just simply a numbers game. Once you know your numbers and you really keep track of it, you realize, hey, if I close, knock on hundreds, I know I'm gonna eventually close a sale. It might take me to the 98th knock or call, might be the 50, might be 300, but I'll close three at once. But those averages work. So once you do that, you can start attributing a dollar value to the people who don't buy from you. And that's a really, really empowering way to look at things. You just heard it from the wolf himself. If you don't quit, you can't fail. You know, uh, only 8% of insurance agents succeed in their first three years. What, what's your thoughts on that? What does 8% mean to you? And how can the 92% become part of the eight? The 8% means you're not being trained correctly or onboarded correctly. Listen, there's no doubt. I, I wear two hats. I recruit for companies and I help salespeople get jobs, right? So there's no doubt that if I give, if I test people, you have people with higher aptitudes or lower aptitudes. What I will tell you is that the great equalizer in all this is the straight line system. I, I could teach someone the straight line system was a very low sales IQ and scores very poorly on a test. And then I'll retest them and they're actually will score the exact opposite it will dramatically raise their competencies and change their beliefs because those two what very few people don't get is that your psychology and your skill sets they play into each other they're very much interrelated because when we think we're great at things we actually work harder at them we enjoy them more for example when, you know it's one thing to try to motivate people saying you're great you're, you're capable of greatness, you're, you're gonna achieve, just work hard. Like the, the problem most motivational speakers is they just motivate, they you know, focus on the inner game of success. The problem is, is if you motivate people to work really hard, go out there, kick ass, but you don't give them the tools to succeed, they get negative results, those negative results reinforce limiting beliefs. So what happens is like when I had all these kids that come to me and they were never successful for them, they never made a lot of money. But then they say, wait a second, I'm looking at all kids who are just like me, all making over a million dollars a year because they learned the system, they learned the straight line. So they called the straight line system the great equalizer. 
it equalized you with people who were better educated, had more natural ability, but by learning the system of influence and persuasion, it equalized you. So if you're in that 92%, you don't have to be. Sales is a learnable skill. It takes work, dedication, and mindset. But once you possess the skill, guess what happens? You start saying, wait a second. So my past results don't necessarily have to equal my future results. I didn't know this. You know, when you learn this skill, it's powerful. It's, and you know you sound better. And people will walk saying, wow, you sound really good. And you start to gain that self-confidence and it feeds on itself and it feeds on itself and actually changes your own belief systems about selling, about persuasion, and that your ability to succeed in that landscape. So it's a huge plus. That's the first thing I do is I, would, I literally would learn a straight line and master your craft. The rest of it is going to become really easy once you do that. Mm. In fact, I'm giving it, and by the way, because of the corona, I normally don't do this, but I'm giving everybody a free training here. So on this call, I'm giving you guys a free module. I have a very high level, robust corporate training program. So on this, everyone here, this is free. And it's not the sort of free where you have to enter your credit card free. I mean, it's just fucking free. It's my gift to you, okay? There's no catches. So enter your credit card. I hope you forget about canceling. No, it's not that. It's just free. So if you go to my website, jordanbelfort.com, slash 8% nation. You can get this training for free. It's powerful and it's life-changing. Wow. Thank you for doing that, buddy. That's huge. That means a lot, man. Uh, I got one last question for you. What, what's your, what's, I'm big on goals. You know, I write down my goals every day. Um, what's, what's JB's goal, man? What's your goal now? What, what's your end game? What's your, what's your big goal? My goal is to really build the largest recruiting agency in the world right now and i and i believe that there is going to be such massive I'm, I'm sorry to say that i believe there's gonna be massive unemployment that's going to stay for a while i don't think it's going to be uh this wild instant v-shaped recovery i believe one day we will achieve our past glory here but i think there's going to be some pain the beauty is is that salespeople who know the straight line system will always be able to get a job and always make a lot of money yes Everyone has lean times as well. There are no guarantees in life. But this is a skill set. It's a required skill. And just so you understand, the straight line was invented for distance selling. It specializes in distance selling, meaning over the phone. Or like this, it was invented as a phone-based, we didn't see someone. And by the way, even though we can see each other, it's not the same as in person where there's a certain energy exchange with body language. It's still not there yet with the technology. It's just not, okay? So you need to learn how to use your tonality, how to use certain facial expressions, even on a Zoom call like this, but the straight line is like built for distance persuasion. So right now, more than ever, it's a system that is like, a, I look at it as a required course. When you choose to take it, that's your choice. But until you do, you're going to be feeling a lot of pain in this new economy that's going to emerge. Unless, of course, you're one of those lucky, natural born closers who has it all figured out. And even you could benefit because it'll show you why you do what you do so well and make you that your best day is every day. Bottom line. Unbelievable, buddy. I, I know we're... We're running out of time. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being on the virtual 8% Nation. Super excited to meet you at 8% Vegas, buddy. Thank you so much. Put the link up so everyone can see the link here. So jordanbelfort.com slash 8% Nation. We will put it up, buddy. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time so much. Season. Thank you. Hey, insurance phone calls are tough. Nobody wants to pick up the phone. Everybody struggles to do this. And I'm going to show you how to nail the first 30 seconds of an insurance phone call right now. There's several mistakes that you're probably making right now. You don't even know that you're making them. Because I used to make, a decade ago, when I started selling insurance, I made 117K in my first eight months. I made a ton of mistakes. I still made 100 grand my first year. However, I made a lot of mistakes that I didn't have to make that I'm gonna share with you because you're making the mistakes right now. And if you stop watching this video right now, you're gonna keep making the same mistakes. But if you keep watching, you will learn the mistakes you're making and how to not make them anymore and why the first 30 seconds are extremely important and how you can nail the first 30 seconds right away. One of the first things that insurance agents don't even realize is 30 seconds is good, but let's think about how literally the first four to five seconds 
is actually the most crucial and important part of a call. You have to nail that initial piece because what you need to do, what you need to think about is being in full control right out of the get-go. Those first four and a half seconds, I need to be in control. First four and a half seconds, I gotta be in control. First four and a half seconds, I gotta be ready. They gotta be, they gotta be listening to me, right? You, people's attention spans are shorter than they ever used to be. Harvard Business Review says four to five seconds. You gotta nail the first four and a half Jordan Belfort, he's speaking to 8% Nation, says, Five seconds, Harvard said four seconds, whatever. First four, four seconds are crucial. And there's primary mistakes that you are making right now that you need to stop making, All right? And the number one primary mistake that insurance agents are making is literally the, the, the first words that they are saying in the intro. A lot of agents have a really bad habit, uh, and I used to have it too. All right, so I'm not just I'm not I'm not, I'm not I'm not I'm not just talking about you right now. I'm talking about myself as well. Most of us are trained when we make a sales call to say, "Is this hello? Is this Betty? Or hello, are you Betty? Or hello, I'm looking for Betty. No more. Can't do that anymore. You don't you don't ask them." Great salespeople ask questions, but great salespeople tell them things instead of ask. So think about this, right? Instead of, is this, say, hello, Betty, right? It, 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 it's more aggressive, it's more confident, it's a better approach, and you will end up getting a better response. Because think about this, who's ever, had someone call them, let's just say, I mean, I, you know, I get calls from Sirius XM all the time because I've owned 42,000 vehicles, right? That's my fault, I guess. But I'll get calls from them and they'll say, is this Cody? Eh, stupid. I, I used to make the same mistake too. Now, and a lot of times I'll say, you know what? Who's ever, you got the wrong number. Has it ever happened to you where someone's called and you're like, ah, no, 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 you got the wrong number. This isn't me, but it's really you. All right, now prospects for insurance will do the same thing if you don't call them out. Is this Betty? Which one sounds better? Hello, is this Betty? Hello, Betty. Right, which one's more confident? Which one gets more control? Which one's less likely to get lied to? Which one is more aggressive? That's why the intro needs to be nailed. That's the first thing, right? That's important. The second thing is I only say I only say my first name, so no last name and no company name. You say, well, dude, that's 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 weird, right? Well, it's, dude, it's weird that you guys do it. You know, I used to make the same mistake. Most people don't know this. When I started as an intern at 19 years old, I was calling for a veteran agent out of the phone book, literally flipping through the phone book and, oh, that looks good. Let's call that person. And I would pick up the phone and I would make those calls and I would literally cold call. And what I didn't realize back then is I was making some bad mistakes and I wasn't nailing the first 30 seconds. And I would be like, you know, hey, this is Cody Askins with Mutual of Omaha back then. And it gave people a chance to interject, to take control, to jump in. And they would end up saying, you know what? who is this or why are you calling me or I didn't ask you to call me or I'm not interested. It gave them a chance to interject. When they interject, when they throw an objection early in the call, you lose control. So the first 30 seconds is all about literally not allowing objections to come up. All right. So hello, Betty. Then this is Cody. That's it. Right. Instead of this is Cody Askins with, you know, the secure insurance company, right? It's no first name. That's it. Right. That's tip number two. The third one is that, that, that and this is, this is continues the first 30 seconds. There's a powerful phrase that I love that is either I'm or were, if you've got a moment center calling for you, I'm getting back to you. Powerful. Not because most people have a bad habit of saying, this is, this is the example of a bad wrong call. Hello, hello, is this Betty? Uh, this is Cody Askins with Secure Insurance Company. Uh, you fill out a form saying you wanted to buy life insurance and then we pause. 
those first 30 seconds, you are begging for an objection. It's not going well. It's, I promise you, they're going to give you an objection. They're going to say, I'm not, not interested. They're going to hang up. They're going to move on when really you should have done something different. And when they, and most agents, and, and, and so a lot of you watching right now, you're going to call a lead and you know, pr probably you're going to get the lead from us because we do hundreds of thousands of leads a month now. And you're going to get the lead from us and, and you're going to call it and they're going to say, oh, I'm not interested. And, and you're going to blame the vendor. You're going to blame the lead when in reality, when I don't have success with something, I, 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 who do you think I blame first? I blame myself, right? So I'm getting back to you. And you could say, maybe you could say, hello, Betty, this is Cody. I'm getting back to you about your request, your request for the new blank information. And then, and then, then I want to confirm some data. Most people are still missing this piece right here. Super important, super valuable, and most people are missing this. I want to confirm some data, all right? I'm getting back to you about your request for the new blank information, right? New Medicare information, whatever. Then confirm data. Looks like you, you, you said your favorite hobby is fishing. I'm assuming that you remember that, right? Does that sound better than, well, did you put your favorite hobby is fishing? Why would you ask them? You know that that is what they put. Or you entered your date of birth as this, right? That, that, I'm assuming you remember doing that, don't you? You notice how I'm ending the question more assumptively, more aggressively, and, and controlling the answer that I get. I'm controlling, I'm getting a yes. I'm not getting a no, you know? It's rare that I get a no. Most people can, they, they, they can, they, we're used to like talking for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, puking on people, vomiting, and we're not used to confirming data. Data needs to be confirmed because it's easy to say, well, you filled out this and you did this and, you know, you know, are you interested? Instead, I'm getting back to you about your request for the new blank information. Then we get to confirm some data, you know, you, Looks like here your favorite hobby is fishing. Thank you for doing that. Hey, I'm assuming that you remember that, don't you? Well, yeah, they do remember, you know, okay? So confirm some data. That's important to let them know who you are. It's a, it's a trust thing at that point. It grabs, it lets them know, hey, I know who you are from the get-go. I have your information. I'm getting back to you. You gave me your info. You gave me this piece of data, and you remember doing that, don't you? It's a different phone call. Right? It really, really is. And then, then you have to you have to move into being the authority. The reason people struggle with the phone call is they lose control because they don't come across as the expert, they don't come across as they have authority, and people want to talk to someone with authority. All right? Confirm data and then, right? So let me roll through it again. Hello, Betty. Hey, this is Cody, getting back to you about your request for the new blank information. You entered your favorite hobby as fishing. I'm assuming you remember doing that, don't you? Yeah, I do, you know. Okay, good, excellent. Well, hey, I'm the local field underwriter. I'll be out in your area on uh, Friday. Should I drop this off in the morning or in the afternoon? Which is better for you? That's the authority and the question. And that's that's the close, that's the, well, most agents say, well, what do you, like, most agents will overcomplicate this. They'll think about everything. They'll say, well, I don't know what you're talking, like, they'll, they'll say, well, well, I don't know, what am I dropping off? Or, like, you know, well, what if, they, what if I get to the door? And most of the time when I get to the door, they forget I was ever dropping anything off anyway. The point is to get in front of them at all costs, without lying, right? So, and you could drop something off. You could drop you off. You could drop information off. You could drop yourself off for an hour. You could drop off a business card. You could drop off a quote. You could drop off whatever, right? You're full of resources. Hello, Betty. This is Cody. Getting back to you about your request for the new blank information. You put into your favorite hobby is fishing. I'm assuming you remember doing that, right? Yes. Okay, great. I'm the local flood underwriter. I've been assigned to help you. I'll be out in your area. Looks like Friday. Good. Should I drop this information off in the morning or in the afternoon? Which is better for you? Right? That's the authority, that's the closing, you're finishing with the question. So I want you to think about this. When you're making calls from now on, I want you to think, I gotta nail the first 45 seconds, and then I gotta nail the first 30 seconds. This, all this, time it, it's within the first 30 seconds. It is. And this is important to nail the first 30 seconds of the insurance phone call. So you stop getting hung up on, so you stop getting, stop getting objections, and you start winning when you make calls. It's crazy to hear.
hear your story and hear over the last 43 years, 18 years, whatever you want to look at Mm -hmm. and compare you probably even what, six years ago Mm -hmm. to today is insane. Hmm. And it should give a lot of people hope that watch. Yeah, that's all I want to give. I I tell people that the one thing that you can take, you can take my money. The the being broke wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part for me was being hopeless. See, most people think that the money, money's fluid. You can make money. I could have went and worked at McDonald's. I could have found a way. But when you don't have hope, that's a scary place to be. And I was hopeless. If you have hope, you're going to make it. That's it. Man. If, if you just have hope, you might not know how you're going to make it. You may not know when. You may not know where. You may not know why. If you have hope, you'll make it. Hope's the one thing you can't take from me. You, listen, you can beat me up. Throw me in a, I, I, got, I was homeless, sleeping in my car, and I had hope. Because I knew that I had the secret ingredient. If I didn't quit, I knew I was going to make it. That's right. I didn't know it was going to happen as fast. So I'm, I'm going to circle way back around. Right. I didn't know it was going to happen. If I have, did I ever dream I was going to make this money? I always dreamed it, but I didn't realize what happened this fast. And it took a long freaking time too, though. You know? Um, it feels like it was yesterday that I was living in my car. Wow. I mean, let, let's talk about it. The one thing that I didn't have when I was broke was perspective. Yeah. Like now, I told you, I, I'm, I'm doing some intermittent fasting. Like when I was broke and I didn't eat till lunchtime, I felt sorry for myself because I thought I was hungry. Now I call it intermittent <laughs> fasting. <laughs> yeah, It's all about perspective. That's right. How do you look at things? And so then I was broke, but I still had my health. I was broke, but I still had friends. I was broke and I had a golden opportunity. It didn't ma- Listen, it don't matter what company it is. Yeah. It really broke, doesn't. But I changed my perspective, and that's the thing that I think wealthy people have is they have a different perspective. I don't think I don't think they have more opportunity. I don't think they have more. I think they have more a different perspective. Yeah. And for me, if I was upright, I was always going to be a father to my children. I was always going to fight for the love of my wife. But the perspective was, I got to go out here and win. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Start acting as if. Mm. So. You're not going to ask the question. I'll just, well, I'm going with it. No, you're good. <laughs> you go, this you is go, phenomenal. You <laughs> what, 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 was, what was your first year like um, with, with Symmetry? You, know, um, you came back. Mm-hmm. You said, I, you know, I want 90 days to prove myself. You went to work. You got serious. Mm-hmm. Walk us through these. Like, how, how long have you been with Nate? And I've been at Symmetry six and a half years, going on seven years. Okay. See, it's impressive when you're home. You're like, I was homeless three years ago. People are like, I'll be telling the story and I'm old. I was homeless 47 years ago. People yeah. are like, ah, oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, my first year with symmetry was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but it was worth it. I always tell people, don't ask if it's hard. Ask if it's worth it. So it was hard because there was a lot of things that that were in me that had to come out that were bad. And there were a lot of good things in me that had to come out to create power and wealth. And and so. Um, I had a lot of bad habits. I think if you look at any person, I'm I'm talking to you and what I hear you talk about a lot, you're saying one thing, but I'm hearing it's habits, habits, habits. I think all wealthy people have great habits. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to change was my bad habits. And so that first year, Nate Offred had a lot of great habits because he had a great mentor that I had to take and and change. Um, What was the worst habit you had? That you've totally fixed, and it's the complete opposite now. I don't know if I'll ever fix it because I think it's it was so natural to me. It was so comfortable. We know that mm. comfort is where things go to die. I know where you're going. I'm a procrastinator. Hi, my name is Marlon. I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's it. Is it's 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 human nature. It's it's what everybody you know. Well. I just hired Coach Michael Burt to work with me. He says something. He says things. The power of what he says, he talked about, he teaches his mind. The first person you negotiate with every morning is yourself. And I know I'm a procrastinator, so I wake up and I start to do things to keep me from procrastinating. If I don't, like sometimes on the weekends, I'm a procrastinator. Yeah. My wife's like, can you clean the this or can you go pick up stuff? And do I'll, it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow, baby. You know <laughs> You know, I worked hard and the kids got basketball games and I'll get, I'm a procrastinator. But here's, here's what I know that there's pain that hurts and there's pain that alters. The pain that hurts is, is not being able to, to buy my son tennis shoes to play basketball. A story I tell is my daughter, we went to 
when I, I don't want to say the name of the store, I went to a big store and I, I bought her these really inexpensive soccer shoes. They were $13. That's all I could afford. They ripped and they tore um, like two days later and I took them back and I yelled and screamed at a lady because I didn't have money to buy more. But oh. she said, I'll give you your money. She said, I'll give you a store credit. They didn't have any more of my daughter's size. And so I fought for 30 minutes to get money to go to the another store to get shoes. The pain, that's pain that hurts. Pain that alters is when I would go to the refrigerator when I was living at home with my wife and my kids and I'd look in the refrigerator and I'd count meals and I'd turn around and count kids and I'd have more kids than I had meals. That's the pain that alters. Mm. The pain that alters is I was sitting at a buddy's house drinking and, and, and playing video games as a 35 year old gentleman and my wife calls me and we're on food stamps at the time and she says the food stamp card won't work and I said well I'm busy I need to figure it out that's pain that alters you so that first year I ran towards here's a good one okay good people people may not get this um, the way to beat procrastination is to run towards pain gosh I love that I, I run towards things that I don't like to do the reason I procrastinate is because I don't like to do them. Like the cold shower. Like the cold, like the cold showers, which I'll tell that story in a minute. Mm -hmm. I run towards things. First thing in the morning, I get up, I meditate, I read a book, I listen to audio, I go to the gym, I come home and take a cold shower. Why? Because I have to trick my brain into doing something I don't want to do. That's right. I've done it for a year now. Listen, it was 30 degrees in Oklahoma the other day. When, when, when it's 80 degrees outside, you take a cold shower, Man, it's a little discomforting. Dude. When it's 30 degrees and you take a cold shower, I become a woman in so many words. Like, I, I'm either cussing myself out. I don't want to do it, but I stay in there until I absorb it and I realize that I'm doing it and I stay in there until I enjoy it and then I get out. I can take a cold shower for five minutes or 30 minutes until I trick my brain into understanding why. My first year at Symmetry, I had to beat that demon a procrastination out of me and I did it because I had a great mentor Nate Alford I had a great mentor and Brad Smith mm. I had a great mentor in Matt Smith I had a great mentor the number one guy at Symmetry Financial Group Edward Pritchett was one of my biggest fans he, this guy is by the book he does everything that he's supposed to do but he told me I do them because I realize if I don't it'll break me like I asked him one time why do we read because we hear people wealthy people read I said why do you read he said if I don't read at some point the money's going to break me so I, I forced myself to read. Now I substituted by listening to a lot of audios. But the first year at Symmetry, I had to get rid of a lot of bad habits. And I'm thankful for all those gentlemen I just named. A guy like Brian Delaney, who had no um, financial gain in my future, would take time on the phone with me. And they wouldn't yell at me and say, you're wrong, you suck. You, Hey, Marlon, have you ever thought that if you go do what you want to do, you can go do what you get to do? Mm. So these guys, I'm getting mentorship. And, and like you said earlier, I'm gravitating towards guys who have great energy, guys right. that are positive. Guys, I, I stopped the two most important decisions my mom told me you'll ever make is where you'll spend eternity and who you hang out with. Mm. Now they say it different in success books. They say you're the, you're, your wealth is the equivalent of the five people that you hang around with. Well, network is your net worth. Your yeah. network is your net worth. But here's the thing that I tricked. Most people don't believe that. Oh, 100, 100, I didn't believe it either. I didn't either. I thought it was cheesy. I thought that was dumb. Well, that I, I can have my buddies Yeah, that, that are working at Quick Trip, and, and Quick Trip's a great company, but the, the, I can't get to where I'm getting to working at a cashier at Quick Trip. If I do, I better be doing something on the side. That's right. I can't get to where I'm getting to when you're going to 9 to 5, and you're happy for the weekends, and I'm waking up happy about Monday because I get to go get it, mm -hmm. and I'm happy about Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And I, I can't be around you because we don't have the same... Birds of the feather flock together. Yeah. So I realized when I started changing the people, it's it's the foundational thing in my life that I'm studying right now. Is you can change. This is the reason why. Listen, let me let me talk to some of you guys. Hi, my name is Marlon. I'm a procrastinator. Have you ever been to an event, some sort of event? You're you're going to 10x uh, tomorrow. I leave tomorrow. It starts Friday. Starts Friday. Unbelievable. You're sitting. Second row. Second row. Can I say that? Unbelievable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unbelievable. I called you to ask you how much money. Second row. Why? Association. If if you ever gone to an event and you came home and you weren't really that changed, here here's why I think it is. I don't know it all. I think the reason that you're not changed is because your mentality changed, but your environment didn't change. Wow. So when I go back 
and I'm an eagle, and I've just been with a bunch of eagles, and these guys are soaring high, and they're rising above the storm, not running from it like a chicken, and they're flying, and they're on a cliff, and you only see eagles by themselves. You don't see them with everybody else, and you come back, and you run a bunch of chickens. At some point, if I'm around a bunch of chickens, what I do is not what they do, and I want to fit in because I like being liked, and I start doing chicken activities. Not that the event didn't change me. The event changed my mentality, but if I don't change my environment, it doesn't matter. Absolutely true. So when I come back from events that first year at Symmetry, I changed my associations. And I have a lot of great friends. That doesn't mean I I kicked them to the curb. Right. That just means I spent more time with guys that had what I wanted. Smaller doses. Smaller doses, brother. I love you. Hey, we can go out. Let's go out next month and watch the fights. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Hey, can you come over tomorrow? Actually, I'm working. I'm at the office. I'm staying late. Hey, I got up at 3 o'clock this morning to read. It's 7 o'clock. I'm tired. And did you, you guys heard that, right? I got up at 3 o'clock. <laughs> like, dude, it's it's insane. I freaking love it. Like, I'm pushing myself a little harder recently because I've got my power five, you mm-hmm. know? 5 a.m. club, workout, write goals, learn, and cold shower. Mm-hmm. And I wimp out of the cold shower every once in a while, mm-hmm. you know? When I heard 3 a.m., mm-hmm. meditate for an hour, mm-hmm. work out for an hour, learn for an hour, and, and cold showers are nothing to me. When I heard that in Dallas at Nate's event, I'm like, Dang, this dude's out. This dude's out working me. Mm. This dude's out doing me. You don't like that? No, I don't like that. <laughs> it's I, Cody Askins, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> dude, I hate it. I like, dude, Marlon Faulkner is. Uh, he's 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 legit. They say life insurance is the hardest product to sell in the insurance industry. If you think so, I can make it real easy if you keep watching this video. All right, so I'm going to teach you how to sell life insurance. My name is Cody Askins. I've been selling life insurance for a decade. I got started when I was 19 years old. And by using this exact formula that I'm gonna share with you today, I earned $117,361.13 in my first eight months. No sales experience, couldn't spell the word insurance, no product knowledge, but by using what I'm about to show you, it made it easy to earn 100K selling life insurance. And it's truly amazing. Okay, so stay with me. All right, so I'm gonna go through, just to preface this, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go through my benefits presentation. There's five benefits that I'm gonna touch on, okay? I'm also gonna go over nine trial closes and three options. And this benefits presentation is so good that by the time I'm done, the the, the, the policy is sold before they even see how much it costs. So if that interests you, you definitely wanna keep watching, okay? Here we go. So when I'm sitting with a prospect, once I'm done with the warm up and I'm done with the fact finding, which means I've warmed them up, that's step one, check, right? Step two, fact finding, actually spending time getting to know their situation, asking them fact finding question, that's step two of the appointment process. If you see my videos, then you know what the other steps are, okay? Once I know everything I need to know and it's time to actually close the deal, I move into step three, which is present and close. And here's what I do in the present and close portion of a life insurance appointment, okay? Because it's time to what? Present and close. So when I jump in, I say, okay, Miss Betty, I have three options that I'm gonna share with you, okay? And we've actually got Hello Betty t-shirts that I'll probably throw in at some point too. Okay, but I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna walk you through what I do with the prospect, all right? So I'll, I'll, I'll actually have a blank piece of paper, okay? And, I'll, and I will write this down on this blank piece of paper. And I'll say, Bet- Miss Betty, there are five benefits of reasons why that prospects do business with us. Can I share those with you, right? Now that's a trial close, okay? And like I said, I'm gonna go through nine trial closes, all right? So that's number one. Can I share these with you, right? Yes, they've never said no, okay? So that's the that's, that's first trial close. You're getting them to say yes, okay? I'll say, okay, the first benefit, Miss Betty, is that this policy has a coverage lock. And what I'll do when I'm saying this is, I, when I'm doing this is I'll, I'll write it down, then I will explain it, and then I will ask a question. Okay, so it's a little three-step process inside of each benefit. So Miss Betty, the first benefit is a coverage lock. 
What that means is, I'll move into explanation, what that means is that the coverage is locked in. So if it's a whole life, you could say, you could say Miss Betty, the coverage is locked in your entire life. Or if it's a term, the coverage is locked in for the entire term period, which is incredible because there's a lot of options out there where the coverage can change every year, go up every five years, or change when you're 80, et cetera, et cetera. The awesome thing is, is that this policy comes with a coverage lock. It's an amazing benefit that our clients love. Is that benefit important to you? Okay, that's the second trial close after first benefit and then move into benefit number two. Okay, so write, explain, and ask. I ask and I move into number two. All right, Miss Betty, the second benefit, and I'm doing this on a piece of paper in front of them. I wanna be in their bubble. I may, I may move across the uh, living room and sit by them on the couch. I may move over uh, around the table and sit by them. I wanna be in their space when I'm doing this. Okay, there's a reason why. All right, so I'll move into benefit number two. Miss, Miss, Miss Betty, benefit number two is that this comes with a price lock. And what that means is the price is locked in the entire time. Okay, there's a lot of options out there, maybe, maybe you know, on TV or through the mail or with somebody else, where the price will change and go up maybe every year or every five years, or when you turn 65, or when you turn 70, or when you turn 80. What clients love about us is that it comes with a price lock and the price is locked in. Do you also like that as well? That's a trial close. Obvious, yes, right? That's a third trial close. Then we'll move, in, we'll, then we'll move into benefit number three. All right, Miss Betty, benefit number three is that this policy comes with, and you can interchange this for any benefit that your policy comes with. I'm gonna use double accident, okay, as an example. Miss Betty, this policy comes with a double accident. In the, in the event that you were to have an accident, it would actually pay off double. So let's just say you, let's just say you had $50,000 worth of coverage. If you had an accident, pass away due to an accident, it would pay your beneficiary Suzanne, right, you need, you need to already know the name. That's, what, that's one of the questions in step two of fact finding, okay? That's where if something some would happen to you do an accident, it would pay your beneficiary, your daughter Suzanne, 100,000 because it comes with this benefit, okay? Accidents don't happen to everyone. However, it's important that if it were to, it gives your daughter extra money. Would you agree with that? Obvious yes, okay? That is a four fourth trial close out of nine. Okay, then we move into our fourth benefit. Miss Betty, our fourth benefit is that this policy comes with a feature and you could interchange this for any feature that you want. I'm gonna use builds cash value. Miss Betty, that it, it, it comes with the benefit of building cash value. It's kind of like a savings account within your policy. It accrues money over time. We don't recommend that you take money out of the policy. However, it is building in there. And if you wanted to, it is your money and you have access to it, okay? It's, that's pretty nice to know that it comes with that feature, correct? Right, good, obvious, yes. Fifth trial close, we're done with the fourth benefit, right? And then we move into the fifth benefit and it has a part A and a part B. And so what I'll tell Miss Betty is, I'm about, to, I'm about to write the fifth benefit down. I'm a little partial, it's my favorite benefit, but I'm gonna explain it to you, okay? The fifth benefit, and I'll write it down, is having a local agent. And I'll tell them, there's two reasons why having a local agent is extremely important, right? And everyone always agrees with me, Miss Betty, okay? The first reason why is that in the event that you need to make minor changes, you would typically have to spend 45 minutes on the phone. You'd have to call somebody, you'd have to, you'd have to call 1-800 number, you'd have to, you know, do, do all these things, jump through all these hoops. Even if you just want to change your address or your beneficiary or, or your how you're paying or, you know, the, 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 the phone number on your policy, et cetera. The minor stuff, right? Instead of having to call 1-800 number, spend on hold for 45 minutes, you don't know who you're talking to, where you're talking to them from, and it's, it's a nuisance, right? It's, it, and nobody likes to do it. Instead of having to do all that, you could literally call my cell phone number and I'll change it for you immediately. That's pretty nice to have, isn't it? Right? Obvious yes. Okay, sixth trial close, and we took care of A, all right? Then you move into B. Now, the second reason why a local agent is so important, Miss Betty, and probably even more important, this, this one, is that when that time comes that you're no longer with us, and your daughter, your beneficiary, Suzanne, okay, she, she would typically, what would typically happen, she'd have to call that same 1-800 number, 
maybe even a different one, which is even more confusing, right? And, 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 and wait on hold for 45 minutes. Don't know who you're talking to, where you're talking to them from, who knows, right? And you, and she ends up having to get, get uh, claim paperwork sent out to her from them. And also go get death certificates from the funeral home and, and get those sent in and, and get everything notarized and, and make sure that, or make sure you don't miss anything. Make sure everything's perfect and, and try to get that back to them as soon as you can and, and then hope that you get a check within a matter of weeks or months when she's already trying to balance and juggle everything that comes with actually you know, going through a funeral and, 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 and celebrating your life however she chooses to do that, that's a massive burden. There's a lot to cover, right? You gotta choose out a lot of stuff. You gotta, there's family coming in, you gotta organize everything, you gotta set everything up, everything is gonna be set up time-wise. You gotta get food for everybody. Why would we wanna add another burden to her, right? You see where I'm going, Miss Betty? What do you think she would do if she was working with a local agent like me, right? She would call myself when I take care of everything for her. I take the burden off of her shoulders and it saves Suzanne time, burden, and stress. Would you agree that that's an extremely important benefit? Obvious, yes. Okay, that brings us to the seventh benefit. All right, now for the, for, I'm sorry, seventh trial close. To move into the eighth trial close, what I'll do is now that I've done all five benefits, I'll say, Miss Betty, to get the eighth trial close, because I said there was nine, which of these five, coverage lock, price lock, double accident, builds cash value, and local agent, is most important to you? Because you see what we're doing here? We're getting them in a habit of making a decision, choosing, saying yes, picking for you. You want to train a prospect to make decisions when you ask questions, all right? And if, and, and if what I'll do is, typically, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this. Miss Betty, which benefit is most important to you? Well, what are they normally gonna say? Hang on for a second. What are they normally gonna say? Three words. I don't know when that happens. Well, Miss Betty, if you had to choose, which one would you choose? Works like a charm every time. I promise they'll be choosing then. Well, if I had to choose, probably price lock. Okay, great, right? I'll circle that one. Excellent, it's extremely important, right? They made a decision. That was the eighth trial close. Then I move into where I actually show them the options, all right? So I'll have a another piece of paper, all right? Or maybe on the back of this one to where I've already got the options spelled out. Maybe I've got 50,000, maybe I've got 30,000, and maybe I've got 10,000, for example. Okay, you could have any options, but maybe this one's 110, maybe this one's 84, and maybe this one's 61, for example. Okay, now there's a reason why they're laid out this way. I'm gonna go back to walk you to this point. There's a reason laid out this way. Number one, you wanna always have the three options from largest to smallest, very important. The psychology is, oh wow, that one's, when you go from large to smallest, oh wow, that one's good, and the other's pale in comparison, okay? Or the other psychology is, if I were to go from smallest to largest, it would feel like, oh, he's, he, you know, he, that, that one seems fine, he's trying to upsell me, right? So that's why we don't do that, okay? The other psychology behind it is I show one option that's always over $100 a month, no matter what. Okay, now if you know what they need and you can develop three options around what they need, then price doesn't matter. That's why in step two of fact finding of the appointment process, I don't ask what, you, what can you afford? What's the best price? What, 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 what do you wanna pay? It doesn't matter. You sell life insurance based on need, not based on price, okay? Now, I like 180 and 60 because most life insurance salespeople undersell themselves. Now if you wanna show bigger options and show based on need, that's even better. Okay, but I'll set that up. And what I'll say is, all right, for the ninth trial close is, Miss Betty, I'm about to show you three options. Okay, we're gonna get to the close, we're gonna get to all of it. This is freaking gold. If you don't make 100K using this, then you didn't get in front of enough people. Would you agree? Another trial close, right? Okay, now what I ask Miss Betty is, Miss Betty, I'm about to show you three options. And I already know which one you're gonna choose, by the way, Miss Betty. But I need a favor from you. When I show you these three options, which are fantastic. They come with all five of the benefits, especially the price lock, which I know you loved. When I show you these, I just need you to let me know which one makes the most sense to you. Can you do that for me? Obvious, yes. Okay, ninth trial close. 
I turn over the piece of paper that would look like this, and I'll say, okay, Miss Betty, here's the three options. Okay, first one's 50,000 for 110, 30,000 for 84, and 10,000 for 61. Which one are you most comfortable with? That's the close. I shut my mouth and I let them make a decision. And if you've warmed up well, if you've fact-finded well, and if you've presented the benefits and the value well, when you get to the close, it is sold and they will be making a decision. Okay, if they say, hypothetically, if they were to say, well, I'm not sure. Well, if you were gonna be doing one, which one would you do? You see the hypothetical, the if? Well, probably the 30,000, because 80% of the time they choose the one in the middle. Fantastic, Miss Betty, and now here's how you continue. Excellent, that's exactly the one I thought you were gonna choose. Let's see if we can get you approved. What's your full legal name? That's it, right? Anyone can be trained to do this. Anyone. I also have another video on how I talk about if they say I want to think about it or if I want you to call me back, I also address that too, right? But I'm not going to address it on this video because this was simply how to present, how to close, how to sell life insurance in the most amazing way ever and how you can earn 100K selling life insurance when you use this. When you make your first 100K, when you use this and it freaking works, come back and let me know in comments below. If you love this and you want to do it without seeming pushy, the next video is right there. It's for you. You're going to love it. Click on it and I'll see you there. I'm going to talk about the five easy ways to prospect without being pushy. I truly believe that, yes, I may be aggressive in sales, but I do it in a respectful way that doesn't feel like it. And so I'm